They thought first of the news media itself when they thought of fake news. 안녕하십니까? 삼성언론재단 상임이사 민병기입니다. 삼성언론재단이 주관하고 한국언론학회 한국기자협회가 공동 주최하는 해외 연사 초청 강연에 참석해 주셔서 진심으로 감사드립니다. 먼저 오늘 진행과 주제 발표를 해 주실 두 분을 소개해 드리겠습니다. 전체 진행을 맡아 주실 분은 이와이대 커뮤니케이션 미대학부의 박성희 교수님입니다. 콜롬비아 대학에서 사회학을 전공하셨고 퍼디 대학에서 언론학 박사를 하셨습니다. 교수께서는 기자로서도 오랫동안 활동하셨으며 현재에도 많은 칼럼을 기고하고 있습니다. 다음은 하버드 대학교의 니먼 파운데이션 제임스 기어리 부소장을 소개하겠습니다. 제임스 기어리 부소장은 타임즈의 유럽판 에디터를 역임하셨으며 현재는 니먼 리포트 에디터로 니먼 파운데이션의 출판을 총괄하고 있습니다. 지금까지 다섯 권의 책을 쓴 현직 작가이기도 하며 2005년 출간된 The World in a Phrase, A Brief History of the Aphorism은 뉴욕타임즈가 그의 베스트셀러로 선정하였으며 한국에서는 인생의 급소를 찌르다 인류 역사상 유대한 아포리즘이 터져나온 순간들이라는 제목으로 번역 출판되기도 하였습니다. 그럼 제임스 기어리 부소장의 강연을 청해 듣도록 하겠습니다. 큰 박수로 맞아주시기 바랍니다. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here this evening, an d an honor, and I'd first like to uh, thank the Samsung Press Foundation for uh, the invitation to speak with you um, this evening, and especially to thank the chairman of the Samsung Press Foundation, Yong Chang Yong. Thank you very much for the uh, invitation, and thank you for that introduction, um, Mr. Min. And Thank you all um, for coming. I wanted to uh, talk to you tonight about football. Um, and unfortunately, I want to talk to you tonight about American football, um, not South Korean football, which Americans call soccer. Um, and I'd like to talk about um, one game in particular. It took place on November 23rd in 1951. And it took place between two American teams, two American college teams, Dartmouth and Princeton. In 1951, Princeton, the Princeton football team, was undefeated. And one of its players, Richard Kazmaier, had just appeared on the cover of Time magazine. And as Mr. Min said in his introduction, I used to work for Time magazine, but not in 1951. It was a little bit before my time. Um, it was a rough game, even by American football standards. Uh, Kazmaier, the quarterback, he had a broken nose and a concussion. Uh, a Dartmouth player had his leg broken. These kind of injuries are very unusual um, in an in American football game. And official statistics kept during the game showed that Dartmouth was penalized 70 yards and Princeton was penalized 25 yards. Uh, that does not include uh, the plays on which both sides received a penalty. But each team accused the other of unsportsmanlike conduct and unnecessary roughness. And the campus newspapers covered this controversy uh, extensively. For example, the Daily Princetonian, that's Princeton's uh, student newspaper, they wrote, this observer has never seen quite such a disgusting exhibition of so-called sport. Both teams were guilty, but the blame must be laid primarily on Dartmouth's doorstep. The Dartmouth, that's Dartmouth's student newspaper, they wrote, Kazmaier's particular injuries, a broken nose and a slight concussion, were no more serious than is experienced almost any day in any football practice. Dartmouth players suffered about 10 known nose fractures and face injuries, not to mention several slight concussions. So two uh, social scientists, 
Albert Hasdorf and Hadley Cantrell. They used this game to explore uh, something that they were interested in investigating, how two groups of people can experience the same thing or the same event and actually see two different things. So Hasdorf and Cantrell showed a film of the game to groups of students at both universities. And then they asked them to answer some questions about the violence and who was responsible for it. So when Princeton students watched the film of the game, they saw the Dartmouth team make twice as many penalties as their own team. When Princeton students judged the seriousness of the penalties, the ratio was about two flagrant or very serious penalties to one mild or less serious penalty. And when their own team committed a, a penalty, only one out of four was considered very serious. So then they showed the, the same film to the Dartmouth students. Um, and the Dartmouth students, they only saw their team make half as many penalties as the Princeton students saw them make. Um, although a third of Dartmouth students uh, felt that Dartmouth itself was to blame for, for starting the rough, the rough play, the majority thought that both sides were to blame. And Dartmouth stu students were convinced um, that the charge of unnecessary roughness against their own players was, was not fair. So Hasdorf and, and Cantrell concluded that although Princeton and Dartmouth students watched the identical film, the same film, they actually saw two different games. And that's the title of the paper they wrote. They saw a game. And they wrote this. It seems clear that the game actually was many different games and that each ver version of the events that transpired was just as real to a particular person as other versions were to other people. So we can see this same thing happening every day all around us. It doesn't happen when people watch football games, but it happens when people read, watch, or listen to the news. I'll just give you a few examples. A few weeks ago, uh, the Democratic leader of the House, Nancy Pelosi, had a meeting with President Trump about infrastructure. And she says he raised his voice, shouted, and stormed out of the meeting, saying he wouldn't work with Democrats until they stopped investigating him. President Trump, of the same meeting, said he was very calm and very rational throughout the entire meeting. And he, during a news conference, he asked his staff in the room to verify that. And they did. Two people, same event, totally different perspectives on what happened. Um, recent survey asked people about um, made up news, uh, fake news. 23% of Republicans and Republican leaning independents say, said they thought first of the news media itself when they thought of fake news. And this is a survey by the Pew uh, Research Center. Uh, only 15% of Democrats and Democratic-leaning independents uh, thought of the news media when they thought of fake news. Um, however, 16% of Democrats thought first of President Trump when they thought of fake news, while only 7% of Republicans felt that way. Again, same thing, fake news, two entirely different perceptions of it. In the UK, uh, proponents of Brexit are convinced that leaving the European, the European Union will restore Britain's sovereignty and lead to economic growth. Opponents of Brexit are convinced that leaving the European uh, Union will destroy Britain's sovereignty and lead to economic catastrophe. And even here in South Korea, the same phenomenon you can observe. There are still divergent views about the Gwangju democ democratization uh, movement. In May, in a speech on the 30, 39th anniversary of that movement, President Moon Jae-in said, no more controversies about this issue are necessary now. The truth about the May 18th movement cannot differ between conservatives and liberals. Our task now is to uncover the truth that has yet to be clarified. This will allow us to put down the heavy historical burden that Guangzhou has so far shouldered and turn the May of tragedy into the May of hope. 
So it seems that even today, we are still experience what, experiencing what Hasdorff and Cantrell observed about that 1951 Dartmouth-Princeton football game. People with different beliefs and different loyalties can look at the same events but see entirely different things. In a recent book, One Nation, Two Realities, Morgan Marietta and David Baker came up with a name for this for phenomenon. They call it dueling fact perceptions, which they define as the tendency of people with opposing values to have opposing ideas about the facts, regardless of what the facts actually are. In their research, however, Marietta and Baker found that people's perception of the facts are not driven by empirical evidence, but by core values and beliefs they already hold, regardless of any empirical evidence. So, ironically, it's not that people first obtain and examine the, fa the facts about an issue and then form an opinion about that issue. Instead, Marietta and Baker argue that people tend to seek out perceptions about facts that already align with their values, and that's what they believe. In other words, dueling fact perceptions don't lead to uh, polarized political values. Polarized political values lead to dueling fact perceptions. So the values come before the perceptions of the facts. And there are so many examples of this today uh, in addition to the ones that I've just mentioned. Just think of the dueling fact perceptions that exist around issues like the persistence of racism, the existence of the climate crisis, a woman's right to abortion, the economic and social impact of immigration, the safety and efficacy of vaccines. I'm sure each of you could come up with a list of your own dueling fact perceptions and the issues surrounding them. It is inaccurate and misleading to say that different people have different attitudes concerning the same thing, Hasdorff and Cantrell wrote in their paper on the Princeton-Dartmouth game. For the thing simply is not the same for different people, whether the thing is a football game, a presidential candidate, communism, or spinach. We behave according to what we bring to the occasion, and what, what each of us brings to the occasion is more or less unique. Now remember, <laughs> these two gentlemen were writing in 1951, not 2019. The social and political consequences of dueling fact perceptions are profound, as Marietta and Baker and many others have observed. Polarized political values lead to more and more dueling fact perceptions. More and more dueling fact perceptions lead to disdain for fellow citizens with opposing views and dis disengagement from civil discourse. Disdain for fellow citizens and disengagement from civil discourse lead to further partisan polarization. Further partisan polarization leads to an erosion in trust in institutions like the government and the media. An erosion of trust leads to the difference between facts and values being further erased. And as the difference between facts and values is further erased, scandals begin to have little or no impact because one side will always reject the facts on which the scandal is based, which further reinforces the polarization of political values. Even more concerning, in Marietta and Baker's view, is that people who hold the least accurate beliefs tend to be most confident about those beliefs. So for example, people who reject the efficacy or safety of vaccines the more evidence that they're presented with that vaccines are in fact safe and effective, the harder they resist those facts. And perhaps even more concerningly, people who are the most politically knowledgeable tend to hold more polarized fact perceptions. So it seems that psychology, human psychology, and technology have coincided to create this divisive political and social moment. Polarized values have coincided with the easy availability of alternative facts, as counselor to the president Kellyanne Conway once memorably put it. An explosion of information has coincided with an implosion of trust. And the rise of partisan media has coincided with the collapse of mainstream journalism's cultural authority and traditional business models. 
There is good news, though. In the UK, a recent survey found that Brexit has made respondents more politically engaged. 40% pay more attention to Brexit news since the 2016 referendum, rising to 50% 50, 50 among those aged between 18 and 24, which is a very encouraging sign. In the US, of course, um, we've seen newspapers like the Washington Post and the New York Times enjoy a robust subscription growth since the 2016 election. The late US Senator Daniel Pat Patrick Moynihan once said, everyone is entitled to his, own, his or her own opinion, but you are not entitled to your own facts. So what can journalists do to ensure that civic discourse is based on facts and not on dueling fact perceptions? Well, one thing suggested by Yokai Benkler of the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard and his colleagues in their book, Network Propaganda, is for journalism to move from its traditional understanding of objectivity as neutrality to a new understanding of objectivity as transparency and accountability. This is one potential problem, to, uh, one potential solution to the problem of false equivalency in which journalists strive to objectively present both sides of an issue, even when one side offers arguments that are false, manipulative, or dehumanizing. Um, in their book, Benkler and his colleagues explained the results of their study of over four million news stories um, conducted over a period of three years, both before, during, and after the 2016 election. And they were trying to understand how media outlets were connected to each other and how news consumption patterns changed among different demographic groups. What they found was the, the so-called right-wing media, most prominently Fox News and Breitbart, that they were insulated from other segments of the media, media ecosystem. These sites tended to repeat and amplify biased, non-factual narratives within what Benkler calls a propaganda feedback loop. The more centrist and left-wing media, Benkler and his colleagues found, tended to be more integrated into the wider media ecosystem, in which mainstream news outlets fact-checked each other's stories, constraining or co correcting partisan statements that could be demonstrably shown to be false. To be clear, the left-wing media also has its own partisan sites. This is not about um, one side of the political, political spectrum or the other. Um, but these outlets, the, 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 the left-wing or more left-wing partisan sites, were, were also corrected by other outlets within the mainstream um, media ecosystem. So what um, the Bankler and his colleagues concluded is that there is no left-right division in the American press, but there is a division between the right and the rest of the media ecosystem with the rest of the media ecosystem operating as an interconnected network anchored by organizations that adhere to professional journalistic norms. In other words, Benkler and his colleagues found that in the mainstream media, dueling fact perceptions are challenged, whereas in the partisan media, whether that partisanship is for the left or the right, um, they are not challenged. Having a segment of the population that is systematically disengaged from an objective journalism and the ability to tell truth from partisan fiction is dangerous to any country, he and his co-authors wrote. They also offered this critique of American political, political coverage. When mainstream professional media sources insist on coverage that performs their own neutrality by giving equal weight to opposing views, even when fault one is false and the other is not, they fail. So in a partisan media envir environment, Bankler says, Neutra neutrality is complicity. Professional journalism needs to recalibrate its commitment to objective reporting further towards transparent, accountable verifiability and away from demonstrative neutrality. And this, in fact, is starting to happen. In November of 2017, um, the Washington Post published allegations that Roy Moore, a Republican U.S. Senate candidate in Alabama, initiated a sexual encounter with an underage girl. 
Um, later, the newspaper was approached by a woman who claimed also to have had a sexual relationship with Moore as a teenager. Uh, this post was suspicious about this woman's story and they investigated her and they, they revealed that she was actually working for an organization that tar targets the mainstream media with false accounts, trying to fool the newspaper into publishing that, something that was not true so that they could criticize them for being biased and publishing fake news later. But the, the Post discovered the truth of what the woman was trying to do, and they published a story about it. And they also um, produced a video that showed the entire process and how they came to discover that she was trying to trick them. Another Post uh, journalist, David uh, Farenholt, he used transparent, accountable verifiability in his crowdsourced Pulitzer-winning investigation of the Trump Foundation. Farenholt combined traditional reporting methods with social media crowdsourcing to involve the public in his reporting on Trump's uh, philanthropic organization and his claims about, about that organization, many of which turned out to be exaggerated or not, in fact, philanthropic uh, activities at all. Um, in one memorable um, uh, piece of reporting, he tracked down a portrait of uh, Donald Trump that um, the President's Foundation had, uh, had purchased. And he did that by asking people on Twitter if they had seen it. <laughs> and someone had at uh, one of the President's uh, golf courses. And Farenholt shared his progress uh, on that story via Twitter, asking reader for tips and information at every stage of his reporting. Now, I want to be very clear. People may legitimately hold different views about Roy Moore's Senate candidacy or President Trump's charitable foundation. But by being so transparent in its reporting and so accountable in showing how it obtained and verified the information it's in its stories, the Washington Post makes it much harder for people to hold different perceptions about the facts. Again, you're entitled to your own opinion, but not your own facts. So if one effect of dueling fact perceptions is that they erode, erode trust in legitimate sources of news, news organizations can try to re restore trust by bringing audiences into the reporting process. Other newsrooms are experimenting with this as well. Jennifer Brandel um, founded a company called Harkin. It's developed a platform through which listeners to public radio, for example, can um, communicate with the newsroom and to tell them the issues that they would like to have covered. She and others are uh, urging that this methodology be used in the, during the coverage of the 2020 presidential campaign in the United States because um, one important critique of the coverage last time around in 2016 was that the issues that were important to large portions of the population were not sufficiently covered um, by the mainstream press that those people were not listened to. So what Jennifer Brandel has come up with is a way to, for newsrooms to listen to their audiences. And one of the questions that uh, she urges reporters to ask voters uh, in this campaign, what do you want the candidates to be talking about as they compete for votes? So for the past two years, journalists at KPCC, it's a public radio station in Southern California, have been doing something similar. They invite community, community members to share questions um, they would like the KPCC reporters to answer. And the station has now introduced mission statements for each of its, reporter, uh, each of its reporters. These are brief descriptions of that person's beat that appear at the bottom of each story. The goal, to narrow the gap between the newsroom and the community it covers. Transparency and accountability. Of course, uh, these innovations face one important challenge. People don't always actually read the stories they say they would like the reporters to write. Um, in a recent survey by the analytics firm Parsley and the news site Axios, uh, people said they most wanted to read news about healthcare, the climate, and the environment, and ed education. The news they actually read, however, um, is mostly about politics, government, and sports. Um, but just as people do not always read the stories that they say they want to read, journalists are beginning to experiment with not always reporting on the things that they traditionally reported on. 
Um, this past March, when a man killed 51 people and injured many others at two mosques in Christchurch, New Zealand, the Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern, Ardern said, one thing I can assure you, you won't hear me speak his name. Now, Arden's uh, comment is based on research that suggests publicizing the identity and ideology of a perpetrator of a mass shooting can lead to copycat killings. It's an expression of an idea known as strategic silence, a deliberate effort to dep deprive perpetrators of mass crime and purveyors of racism or other hateful I ideologies of the publicity that they seek. The idea is supported by relatives of victims, law enforcement agencies, and researchers, and some media organizations are beginning to employ this strategy too. A study of some 6,000 stories about the Christchurch attacks found that only 14% of US publications named the shooter, and almost none linked to his manifesto or the forum where he posted it. This is according to a, a forthcoming article that we will be publishing in Neiman Reports, one of the publications we um, uh, we produce at the Neiman Foundation. When the accused trial began a few weeks ago in, in New Zealand, some of that country's major media organizations uh, put out a joint statement that read in part um, that they vowed to the extent that is compatible with the principles of open justice, limit any coverage of statements that actively champion white supremacist or terrorist ideology. Some are now calling for strategic silence to be extended to dis and misinformation too. A review by the um, research organization Media Matters for America suggests that in the case of false or misleading tweets by President Trump, for example, media outlets continue to more often amplify those statements rather than rebut them, even when they are false. Um, and I'm sure you've seen this on your own social media feeds and on um, TV news, um, headlines that feature a, a, a quote from President Trump or, or anyone else that is false, those are um, published and displayed without the necessary context or without the explanation that the statement is in fact false or misleading or incre incorrect. That, in that practice um, by journalism organizations allows dueling fact perceptions to fester. There's a longstanding journalistic assumption that when a politician, what, what a politician says, especially the president, is inherently newsworthy. And if a statement is true, that may well be the case. If a statement is false, misleading, or extremist, however, then strategic silence might be the more journalistically sound response. The choices reporters and editors make about what to cover and how to cover it play a key part in regulating the amount of oxygen supplied to falsehoods, antagonisms, and manipulations that threaten to overrun the contemporary media ecosystem. Um, these are the words of Whitney Phillips, who wrote a, a report called The Oxygen of Amplification, about how the media covers extremists. News coverage of messages emanating from extremist corners of the internet makes particular stories, communities, and bad actors bigger, more visible, more influential than they would have been otherwise. And the purveyors of these kinds of, of messages know that the journalistic instinct is to report the news. And in an ironic way, they're using journalism's own professional practices to further their own agendas. While choosing not to amplify misinformation or extremist views, reporters can also choose to amplify other voices, other voices that are less often heard through what's come to be called in the United States dialogue journalism. These are collaborations between newsrooms and communities in which people with differing views come together online and in person to learn about and debate the issues on which they disagree. Spaceship media, is one new media organization using dialogue journalism to bridge partisan divides and rebuild trust in the news. Partnering with news organizations, Spaceship Media facilitates conversations in communities in conflict, with journalists augmenting the conversations with reported stories so that participants ground their discussions in factual information. Among the conversations Spaceship Media has so far held, um, they have been in about agriculture in Minnesota, 
guns in America, the housing crisis in San Francisco. Spaceship Media is now in the midst of its bi biggest project yet. It's called The Many. And they're using a closed Facebook group to bring together women from across the United States to discuss their differing political, social, and cultural beliefs. Now, the goal of these initiatives is not to change anyone's mind about any specific issue. Um, the goal is for people to engage respectfully in fact-based debate rather than remain mired in, ac in inaccurate dueling fact perceptions. A similar motivation is behind a new initiative by StoryCorps called One Small Step. For many years in, in the US, StoryCorps has facilitated conversations between, between ordinary people without the mediation of professional journalists. These conversations are recorded, broadcast, and archived. Anyone with a smart smartphone can download the StoryCorps app and record a conversation of their own. The One Small Step conversations are specifically designed for people with opposing political views to listen to each other with respect. Um, there's one very remarkable uh, One Small Step conversation that I listened to uh, in preparation for this talk, and it took place between uh, a Muslim woman and a male supporter of President Trump. Uh, they had met at an anti-Trump rally, in fact. The man attended the, the anti-Trump rally wearing a Make America Great Again shirt and a Make America Great Again hat. And at the rally, he was assaulted by a group of people who attempted to remove his hat and burn it. The Muslim woman, who was also in attendance, saw this and she became furious and she rushed over to the group. And she rushed over not to join in the, in the assault of the man wearing the Make America Great Again hat, but to defend him. And the reason she felt she had to defend him was because a similar thing had happened to her. She was at an, um, an event and people tried to remove her hijab, the headscarf that many Muslim women wear. And she found that to be a violation. And when she saw that happening to a man with whom she could not disagree more on political issues, she felt compelled to defend him. And they had a conversation about it. And the man said this, it was a common not okay moment. <laughs> and I think when two people are so divided on such important issues, to have them agree that it was a common not okay moment is fantastic progress. I think it was also a remarkable example of how two people who hold opposing political views can nevertheless find common ground. At a time when journalists and journalism are under assault, financially, politically, even physically, it is very, very easy to be pessimistic. But initiatives like the ones I've described, together with traditional investigative work that remains essential to holding the powerful to account. I think these initiatives show that journalists and journalism can reassert the primacy of facts as the foundation on which civic discourse and democracy depend. And a model for how to think about this moment in our political and social lives is not actually the American football game I described at the beginning. Um, it's really um, a distinctively Korean art form, ceramics. Some of the finest examples of Korean ceramics were made in the 18th century in the royal kilns at Gwangju. And for me, the most strikingly beautiful pieces are the milky white porcelain vessels known as moon jars. That's a moon jar there. I've recently become obsessed with moon jars. Um, I've had the opportunity to travel to New York and Chicago recently, and in each of those cities, um, I found moon jars. <laughs> Um, and I came across them just by accident, um, and I just became fascinated by them. When you first look at the moon jar, it looks really kind of plain and simple. Um, 
and really not all that interesting. But if you look closely, uh, different facts and different views about the moon jar emerge. Moon jars, they got their name because they are large, round, and white, just like the full moon, originally made to contain uh, flowers or, or wine, um, in part because they are so large, moon jars are very difficult to make. They have to be made in two halves, and because the wet clay is so heavy, the halves tend to sag or bend as they are put into the kiln for firing. As a result, moon jars are never perfectly round. They always contain some imperfection, some flaw, and this imperfection, this flaw, is an essential part of the moon jar's charm and beauty. In the example on the screen now, you can see it's slightly off balance. Um, also, when the two halves of the jar are fused in the kiln, it leaves a seam, and you can see it if you look closely, and it goes all the way around, and it's that seam that connects the two halves together. And if you touch a moon jar, you can feel the seam. It feels like a little wrinkle on skin. Like a moon jar, journalism is the seam that fuses together the two halves of divided societies. A perfect union happens when the top and the bottom surrender their individual selves and reach a compromise to exist forever as one. That's what Young Suk Park, one of South Korea's most famous contemporary artists, says of her uh, experience making moon jars. And that moon jar on the screen was made by her. Though technology and society have changed and continue to change, journalism's most urgent task has not. It remains to provide the common set of shared facts that is the only thing that holds together those with opposing political and social views, even if, especially if, the whole that the, these two halves form will always remain slightly imperfect, slightly flawed. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank <laughs> 또 어, 일선에 있는 언론인들은 정치 양극화 과정에서 어떤 역할을 하고 해소하기 위해서 어떤 노력과 기여를 해야 하는지 아, 이런 부분에서 이야기를 나눠보고자 합니다. 관련해서 방금 너무 좋은 스피치를 우리에게 감동을 주신 어, 니만 파운데이션의 제임스 기어리 부 큐레이터님께 다시 한번 우리 박수로 모셔보겠습니다. Thank you. Thank you. For such an insightful and full of information speech you just gave us, I especially like the moon jar part at the end. And I mean, who would have thought to draw the connection between the moon jar and journalism? That was one of the, one of the most creative metaphors that I've ever encountered for <laughs> past few years, at least. And um, so, uh, and it had such an accurate account of the process of making moon jars. I'm not even sure if many Koreans are familiar with the process. But uh, so for that, I'm pretty impressed. And so before anything, I thought I must tell you that you are a master of metaphor, <laughs> without a doubt. <laughs> 제가 마지막 그 부분에 그 달항아리를 우리 저널리즘에 비유하신 부분에 대해서 어, 그 비유의 달인이다 이렇게 칭송을 해드렸는데요. 어, 제가 마음에 정말 와닿았던 부분은 그 달항 항아리가 좀 불완전하지만 그 있는 이음새가 있기 때문에 달항아리의 어떤 정체성과 모양이 유지되는 것처럼 우리 사회도 
불완전하고 모순으로 가득 차 있지만 어딘가에서 이거를 잡아주기 때문에 우리 사회가 하나의 모양으로 가는 것이다. 그리고 그것을 저널리즘이 해야 하는 역할이다 이런 말씀을 해주셔서 정말 아름다운 비유라는 생각이 들었어요. 동의하시죠? <웃음> 그래서 제가 궁금한 것이 어떻게 하면 그렇게 멋진 비유를 생각해내실 수 있는지 이게 궁금합니다. How did you come up with such a great metaphor? Um, well, thank you for that. Um, my secret, um, I can't tell you it's a secret. <laughs> I don't, it's not a secret. I think it's what, um, it, it, it's what journalists do. They notice things and they pay attention to things and understand how things that may not seem related to one another actually are related to one another. And I had read, um, I had read about that paper, um, the 1951 paper about the Dartmouth-Princeton football game, and I just, I, I liked the title of that paper, and I just thought I would read it because I liked the title. Mm. And it turns out I was reading and I think, oh my God, this is so, applies so much to what's happening today. So relevant, right? Yeah. Mm. And it was the same with a moon jar. Um, when I received the, the invitation to speak to you this evening, um, like a journalist, I decided to prepare. <laughs> and I did some research, and um, I've been to South Korea once before, and um, became fascinated with uh, aspects of the culture, um, specifically a South Korean poetic form called the Sijo. And so in researching that, I also came across moon jars. And as I said in the, in the talk, I just found them beautiful, and beautiful in a way that is surprising because they look so ordinary. And I think one of the tasks of journalism is to examine the ordinary. And find a story in it. And find the story in it, exactly. <laughs> and as I did some research on moon jars, and as I said, I, I had to make some trips recently, and I went to, um, I investigated the museums, and I identified the ones with moon jars, <laughs> and I went to see those moon jars. And as I learned more about them, just like reading that paper about the Princeton Dartmouth football game, I realized moon jars, wow, that's just like journalism to, today. And I think the, the importance of metaphor um, is a metaphor helps you understand something. A metaphor is very kind of con concrete and practical uh, and specific. And if you can make a very complicated um, abstract issue like polarization specific through a metaphor, I think it, it helps me as a journalist understand it and it helps me talk about it. And so as I learned more about the, the, the moon jar, and its simplicity, um, but behind that simplicity is, is very deep complexity, and that seam that connects uh, the two halves. And the thing that really um, sealed it for me was it's the imperfection, and that the imperfection is valued. <laughs> so a moon jar, because it's slightly lopsided, is not thrown away. It's valued all the more for that imperfection. And that seemed to me a perfect metaphor for our societies. our societies, your societies here, your society here in South Korea and mine in the United States. We're imperfect, we're flawed, we're, we're lopsided, but we need to stick together uh, because that's the only way that um, these issues can be resolved and problems can be solved. And I think uh, mm -hmm. that's, um, journalism has a role to, to play in that process. Yeah. 제가 이 시점에서 잠깐 보충 설명을 좀 드리면요. 어, 책을 여러 권 쓰셨는데 그 책들이 대부분은 메타포 내지는 언어와 관련된 것입니다. 제가 메타포의 달인이다 라고 칭송을 해드렸다고 했는데 사실 칭송이 아니라 팩트입니다. 들어오시기 전에 그 테드 강의를 보신 분은 그 메타포에 대해서 테드 강의를 하는 모습, 하시는 모습을 보셨을 것 같습니다. 어, 그리고 지금도 그 언어와 관련돼서 지금도 하버드 대학에 있는 그 익스텐션 스쿨에서 어, 피처 라이팅, 그다음에 넌 피처 라이팅 이런 거 강의를 하고 계시고 또 정말 최고의 글쟁이들이 가는 그 타임 매거진의 편집장을 17년 하셨습니다. 지금 니먼 파운데이션 나오는 모든 출판물을 다 관장을 하고 계십니다. 
<웃음> 그래서 근데 메타포는요 흔히 이게 천재들의 산물이라고 합니다. 메타포는 어, 그 메타포에 대해서 쓰신 책 제목이 I is an other 라는 제목의 메타포 관련 책이 있습니다. 거기 보면 우리가 1분 동안 메타포를 6번을 이야기한다는 표현이 나와요. 그러니까 제가 지금 나와요 하는 일, 이것도 메타포입니다. 나온다는 표현. 그러니까 이렇게 우리는 피할 수 없는 어떤 언어의 세계에서 살면서 그 메타포 안에서 살고 있는데 이게 메타포가 중요한 이유는 말을 장식적으로 해주는 것이 아니라 세상을 보는 인식의 틀을 제공하기 때문에 그렇다. 그렇기 때문에 언어를 사용하는 사람들의 그 저널리즘과 이 메타포와 언어와의 관계는 그냥 떼려야 될수 없는 관계입니다. 그래서 이제 다음 질문은 제가 그 저널리즘과 메타포의 관계를 좀더 얘기를 해주시면서 왜 라이팅이 중요하고 어떤 라이팅 팅이 되어야 하는지 저널리즘에 있어서 중요한지 그 부분을 좀 자, 어, 진짜 그 건의자로서 조금 우리에게 주시, 말씀을 해주시면 도움이 많이 될것 같습니다. On writing? Yes, um, thank, thank you for that question. Um, I think the, the challenge that um, the challenge that journalism faces, one of the, the, the many, is journalists traditionally compete with each other. The Washington Post competes with the New York Times, the New York Times competes with the Wall Street Journal, and so on and so on. And that's a productive uh, competition. But today, the competition, journalism is competing with way more <laughs> competitors than simply other news publications. We're competing with so many other sources of information, so many other sources of entertainment, And the thing that we're actually competing for is your attention, the attention of the audience. And what, we've, what we see, in a way, is as the, the problems that uh, societies face, whether it's political or economic or environmental, these problems are deeply interconnected. Economics is connected with the environment. So if you change an economic policy, it will have an impact on the environment. If you introduce an environmental policy, it will have an impact on um, economics. All these things are connected to um, human psychology and how people receive and process information, um, how they are motivated um, to uh, purchase things. We see this uh, in social media all the time and on Facebook, the way targeted advertisements are um, determined and, and served to, to people. So as the issues we face become more and co more complex, um, we've seen introduced into the culture forms of communications that are shorter and shorter and shorter, <laughs> and simpler and simpler and simpler. And I don't think many of the world's problems can be solved with a tweet, um, no matter how hard um, you try. So I think part of the, the importance of writing uh, and part, part of the, um, the role that metaphor, for example, can play in, in, in journalistic writing is to create works of journalism that audiences find compelling enough to um, engage with for a longer period of time than a simple tweet or to engage with more than just to read the headline and think you know what the story's about and, and then move on. And in the United States, there's a... Um, a tradition of narrative nonfiction storytelling, um, which is characterized by many of the same techniques that are used in other forms of writing. We're accustomed to seeing um, metaphor and poetry, but metaphor can be in journalism as well. Um, and again, when you're telling a complex story, a very effective metaphor can, can uh, communicate a lot, a lot more information than a very detailed, um, uh, not literal description. So I think um, the Neiman Foundation, just uh, two months ago, we, um, a, a, a book that we published uh, eight years ago, Telling True Stories, uh, was published, translated into Korean and published here. Um, and that book is all about the craft of journalism. It's the craft of reporting, um, the craft of interviewing, but also the book deals uh, in detail with uh, the art of journalism. Because I think there is, um, in narrative nonfiction, a combination between traditional reporting techniques, um, always based on facts and verified information, and the artfulness comes in uh, in the way that that story is told. 
So I think journalists at their core are information gatherers, but they're also crucially storytellers. And I think the, the, the better storyteller you can be, the more engaged um, an audience will be. And I think that, um, I think many of the, the most important stories of the day can only be told in that, that long, longer form. And um, so the, the, the combination of the craft of journalism with the art of journalism, I think is a crucial, um, a crucial, um, like a moon jar, if I can use a metaphor again, um, when those two halves come together, it's a, it's a, a very beautiful thing. 그 라이팅이 얼마나 중요한가 어떤 단어를 선택하느냐 하나가 세상을 왜곡시키기도 하고 제대로 전달하기 때문에 그런 것 같다. 그런 말씀으로 제가 이해를 하겠습니다. 그 아까 가치관, 가치관이 어 퍼셉션에 우선한 그러니까 먼저 가치관이 있기 때문에 어떤 팩트가 있어도 그거를 다르 다르게 이해한다는 그 마리에타 앤 베이커 그 듀얼링 팩트 퍼셉션이라는 개념을 소개해 주셨는데 매우 흥미롭다는 생각을 했습니다. 그리고 이와 유사한 연구가 커뮤니케이션 분야에서도 있는데요. 어, 건터라는 학자가 어떤 실험을 하나 했습니다. 그 같은 똑같은 기사를 어, 중립적으로 써서 하나는 이스라엘 학생한테 보여주고 하나는 팔레스타인 학생한테 보여주고 실험을 했습니다. 어떻게 생각하느냐 그랬더니 이스라엘 학생은 그 기사가 팔레스타인 쪽에 유리하게 경도돼 있다, 편향되어 있다 이렇게 평가를 했고요. 똑같은 기사인데 팔레스타인 학생들은 이 기사는 이스라엘 쪽에 편향되어서 작성되었다 이렇게 이해를 하더 평가를 한 그런 연구 결과가 있어서 그것을 이제 소위 적대적인 매체 지각이다 이런 연구 논문을 발표를 했습니다. 그러니까 언론 는 팩트를 어, 찾아내고 팩트를 차, 어, 팩트를 검증하는 게 언론의 일인데 그리고 그걸 또 중립적으로 보도하는 것인데 어떤 during uh, fact perception 혹은 hostile media perception 같은 것들이 있음으로 해서 약간 어, 저널리즘 행위나 우리가 하는 일에 대해서 어, 좀 너무 그 어, 소위 그좀 길을 죽인다 그럴까요? 디스커리지 시키는 그런 연구 결과들인 것 같아요. 근데 그래서 제가 이런 연, 사실 뭐 이거는 사람이기 때문에 갖고 있는 어떤 그런 그러니까 perceptual bias라고 인지, 인지적인 오류거든요. 그래서 제가 이제 질문은 어, 이런 어, dueling fact perception이나 hostile media perception에도 불구하고 언론은 그래도 사실을 계속 찾아내야 하지 않을까. 그 다음에 사실은 여전히 중요하고 사실을 확인하는 작업과 중립성을 유지하려는 노력을 하는 데서 언론의 정의가 아직 유지되어야 하는 건 아닌지 아니면 다른 다른 대안은 있는 것인지 그 부분에 대해서 좀 답변을 해주시면 감사하겠습니다. Um, yeah, I think the I think the um, dueling fact perception. Bias, I think, is it's normal. Human beings have biases. And I think it's, it's hard not, not to. Um, and in, in the United States, there's a lot more attention being paid currently to something called implicit bias. And those are biases that uh, individuals have that they're not even aware that they have. And they can be very, very subtle um, things that express themselves in sort of trivial interpersonal interactions. Um, so I think the problem is not that um, human beings are biased. That's part of being human. We're naturally more loyal to our family. Or if you went to Princeton, you're more loyal to Princeton than you are to Dartmouth. Um, so I don't think it's having a bias that that's the issue, but I think it's, as I said uh, in the talk, it's the combination of technology with human psychology um, and society that makes biases um, no longer checked the way that they would be in the past. So um, part of um, what's been happening in journalism is that, as I, as I said earlier, there's so many more um, sources of, of information, and people can choose where they um, get their information from. 
20, 30 years ago, that was much less the case. In the United States, there were like three television channels, and if you watched, you got your news from TV, those were your choices. So choice is a good thing, um, but the fact that you, you had a limited a set of um, choices meant that you were confronted with things that you would not choose to, to hear or to read or to watch. And I think now, because uh, individuals are empowered to create their own channels of communication and information, that you can arrange your media consumption so that you never encounter something that you disagree with. And I think that's part of what um, the research of Yokai Bankler and his colleagues showed, that for a significant se segment of the U US population, they receive their information in this closed loop. And that loop, and there's um, diagrams in the book that map out the connections. And you see that the, the Fox, Fox News and Breitbart are in their a separate little universe with little to no connection to other news outlets. And the other news outlets are all connected very deeply um, intertwined with each other. And so I think when bias meets um, uniform, a uniform source of information, that's where things can get difficult. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think for, um, for journalism, the challenge is um, how to integrate. It's not how to suppress views with which mm -hmm. you disagree, but to integrate all the views mm -hmm. in society and allow um, interaction and debate. Again, not for the purpose of convincing anyone to, to hold a view that, um, that you hold or to discourage them from believing something that you don't believe. Um, it's just to have the debate. Um, and I think that's what these mm. uh, initiatives that, uh, that I described in, right. in the talk are, are trying to do. They are trying to create an environment where people encounter um, views and opinions that they would not otherwise choose to encounter and which they, with which they may disagree profoundly. But that's really, if you, th if you think about it, that's the way we learn, right? That's the way s societies grow. You learn from encountering things that are unknown to you and unfamiliar to you and challenge you. And I think that's where um, things are, are breaking down, mm -hmm. that the natural human tendency to be biased mm -hmm. is finding that it gets, that bias gets amplified and has no kind of... Um, uh, limited views and less facts, right? So yeah. the journalism should provide more facts and more diverse opinions. Yes, right. and, but also I think what, what's interesting mm -hmm. about some of the, the things I mentioned is it's not the journalists it's the people interacting with themselves and the journalists are facilit facilitating that. And I think that's part of the, goes back to the trust issue. Mm -hmm. People don't trust uh, information that comes from uh, mainstream news sources, for, for example. But when they encounter someone else who's a real human being, like those two people in the, the story core story, who disagree so profoundly about politics, but they have a shared experience. Mm -hmm. That, and that seam, that's where journalism, the seam of shared experience and shared facts, that's the seam where I think journalism can, can be effective by um, continuing to, to do the traditional forms of reporting that, that, um, that journalists have always done, by also, but also by innovating and creating these other forums where um, transparency and accountability um, can be expressed as a way to restore trust in this common set of mm. facts. 그 신뢰에 대해서는 제가 질문이 하나 뒤에 하나 있습니다. 지금 신뢰에 대한 질문을 안 드리고 어, 지금 팩트 이야기가 나왔기 때문에 팩트에 대한 얘기를 좀더 드리면 팩트가 요즘 너무 많은 세상에 우리가 살고 있기 때문에 팩트 사이에 어떤 산술적인 균형을 맞추는 것은 더 이상 의미가 없다. 그러면서 투명성 과 책임성을 강조하셨어요. 어, 이 부분은 어, 굉장히 중요한 부분이었다고 생각을 합니다. 그러면서 어, 팩스 뉴스의 예를 들으시면서 
아무리 그 듀얼링 팩트 퍼셉션에 사로잡힌 언론이 있다 하더라도 어떤 건강한 미디어 생태계 안에 들어가서 서로 상호 교정되는 시스템이 있으면 어 그게 이제 하나의 구, 구원의 구원을 받을 수 있는 하나의 길이 아닌가 이런 말씀을 하셨는데 어, my question is <웃음> 그 미디어 생태계 요새 아주 스트롱 그 플레이어가 하나 들어왔죠. 그게 SNS입니다. SNS가 들어와서 이 정치 어, 양극화에 어떠한 영향을 주고 있다고 생각하시는지 좀 어, 답변 부탁드립니다. 음, it helps a lot. <웃음> helps in, in what way? <웃음> to make it worse. To make it worse, <웃음> right? <웃음> um, I don't. Um, I think um, so. I think the as I was saying earlier, um, I think that social media is is can be a very good thing, and I, I don't want to uh, give you the impression that I, uh, I'm against social media. But I think like every um, every format is suited to a certain kind of story. Um, the And that's you know that's like one of the the first questions that an editor will ask you when you come with a story idea, or that's the first discussion uh, that will be had. Is this uh, a short news story? Is it a long feature story? Is it a six-part series? Should we make it a podcast? You know, is there a video component? Who's going to take the pictures? These are all different genres and all different formats, and a different different stories work best in different genres. Something that works really, really well as a, um, uh, a video, for example, or a podcast, wouldn't work at all as a, a feature story, for example. So I think the same is true for um, not just uh, journalistic forms, but also means of communication. And uh, social media um, is, is a, an amazing thing. And um, my Twitter feed, I'm constantly Um, exposed to new ideas and things that I would have never encountered otherwise. Um, I don't. I'm not on Facebook much. Um, I find that less useful for <laughs> for for my needs. But I think they all have a have a place. And but I think it's also true that they are not the proper medium for communicating about um, some of the things we're discussing here tonight. Because I think one thing that social media does is it encourages immediacy. It encourages an immediate reaction. Um, yeah. And um, sometimes it's the, the right thing to do to have an immediate reaction. But sometimes you need to pause and you need to reflect on the information that you're receiving. And you need to actually think critically about it before you have an opinion. <laughs> you need to gather the facts before you have an opinion. And this is becoming now even much more um, urgent with uh, the, the, the rise of deep fake videos and um, deliberately um, manipulated uh, videos. There was an example of recently in the United States of Nancy Pelosi again. She was giving a speech and someone slowed down the video so it appeared that she was drunk and slurring her words. It was completely fake. But millions of people saw it. And millions of people were immediately outraged. So I think, you know, we need like a circuit breaker, you know, when electricity in electrical systems, when too much power comes through uh, the system, a circuit breaker cuts off the power. I'm not saying we should cut off social media, please. <laughs> But I think in our own minds, um, we need. Um, We need a fake news circuit breaker so that when we read something or hear something and we have an immediate emotional reaction, which is, again, it's totally, totally normal. But let's pause and be sophisticated consumers of media and think, do I trust this source? Um, is there more that I can learn about this? Maybe there is context that would explain um, what this person did that so uh, outraged me. So I think... Um, I think that, that that's partly um, a discipline that we as individuals need to acquire. Um, and I think it's partly a, a way that news organizations need to use these technologies, like, like I was saying earlier, 
not to just simply repeat a false statement, knowing that most people on Twitter are just gonna see the headline, they're not gonna read the story. That perpetuates a falsehood. Um, that's not reporting the news, factually or accurately, if you're just amplifying a falsehood. So I think there are things that news organizations can, can do, but I also think consumers who want mm -hmm. to have a healthier um, life on social media they also need to acquire maybe a different set of um, critical thinking skills and discipline in the way that they uh, interact with, with right. information online. Media literacy is Media, called, yes, right. exactly. Right. 지금 말씀을 들으면서 제가 좀 생각이 났는데요. 워싱턴 포스트나 뉴욕 타임즈가 트럼프가 들어서서 뭐 저, 저 구독주, 구독자가 늘었다 이런 얘기가 많이 나오는데 그 소셜 미디어가 그렇게 그 political polarization에 오히려 어, 안 좋은 영향을 미친다면 그 시민들은 좀 위협을 느끼지 않을까 싶은 생각이 들어서 그리고 균형을 잡기 위해서 오히려 그런 올드 미디어로 해서 균형을 찾으려고 하는 그런 어, 본능 때문 본능이 작용한 건 아닌지 그런 생각이 드네요 말씀을 듣고 보니까 어떻게 yeah, 생각하세요? Yeah, and I think that's um, one of the very encouraging trends that we've seen. Um, so not only are more people seeking out um, reliable, fact-based, legitimate, professional journalism, they're actually paying for it. <laughs> and I think that's crucial. Um, and we, like I've said, we've seen that in uh, surveys in the UK. Um, um, just, I think, two or three days ago, there was a group of um, environmental activists who um, blocked um, the, the, the street in front of the New York Times offices in New York City. And they were demanding that the New York Times and other journalism organizations provide more and better coverage of the climate crisis. Mm. And for me, that is an incredibly hopeful and encouraging sign that, because you don't pro protest out someone's, outside someone's offices who you think is not influential. What would be the point of that? So the fact that that group chose to protest outside um, the New York Times, for me, is an indication that they realize that professional journalism matters and that the, the work that the New York Times and other organizations do has an effect and has an impact. And so for me, that's a really encouraging sign that people are, are turning to, um, after shunning um, uh, journalism uh, for, for, sh for so long, these various uh, issues that we're facing, and it's, they're not all political by, by any means, um, but economic and, and um, environmental, that they realize the value of um, real journalism. Yeah. And so while that is well, a very- it's good that they begin to feel their responsibility, right? Yeah, mm. and I think um, the one statistic that I mentioned in, in the talk that, um, 50% of the people in that UK survey between the ages of 18 and 24 were seeking out more news. I think that is incredibly encouraging. Um, and because young people, um, to, they, they're growing up in an environment that is so drastically different from the one, the media environment that the one, the, the one the parents grew up in. And um, if younger people see value in, in journalism and are willing to uh, seek it out and pay for it, that's, that's mm. a really in, incredible um, positive mm. sign. 이제 뭐 좋은 말씀입니다. 근데 그럼에도 불구하고 사실은 그 신뢰도, trust의 문제가 전 세계 언론의 지금 공통적인 문제입니다. 신뢰도가 계속 하락하고 있는 상황이거든요. 근데 아까 그 투명성을 통해서 워싱턴 포스트 같은 경우에 에, 투명성을 통해서 신뢰도를 높였다. 근데 우리는 거기까지는 안 가더라도 적어도 취재원을 밝히고 취재원을 섭외하게 되거나 발굴한 과정까지도 밝히는 정도는 해야 되지 않을까 이런 생각이 드는데 그러면서 이제 독자나 시청자들을 참여시킴으로 해서 신뢰도를 높인다. 투명성을 매개로 해서 그 이게 좋은 이제 그 논리이기는 한데 이게 이제 뭔가 달기 먼저냐 달걀이 먼저냐는 문제인 것 같아요. 그러니까 이 독자가 언론을 신뢰해야 또그 언론에 또 참여를 하고 그 참여에 
그 고리 안으로 들어갑니다. 저는 정말 궁금해요. 근데 신뢰도를 굉장히 많이 연구들을 합니다. 근데 신뢰도는 한 가지로 구성된 것이 아니라 그 안에는 뭐 호감도, 충성도, 뭐 여러 가지가 다 들어가 있습니다. 그래서 정말 그 언론의 신뢰도는 어디서 오는 것인지, 어디서부터 시작해야 되는 것인지 그런 걸좀 여쭤보고 싶어요. Where do you think the trust in media come from? Um, I think it comes from um, seeing journalists respond to the issues that, that matter to them, I think in part. Um, one thing that's happening in, in, the in the United States is that while publications like the, the Washington Post and the New York Times and increasingly the LA Times um, are thriving and are thriving journalistically and commercially, there are huge areas of uh, the media, media ecosystem in the United States that are not thriving. Uh, local and regional um, um, news outlets are in a deep, deep um, um, commercial crisis because they just have not yet been able to innovate a business model that allows them to do the kind of ambitious um, investigative work as well as the day-to-day -day reporting that is um, crucial to, to serving communities. So I think one missing link in trust is where um, people don't see journalists in their, uh, as often in their day-to-day -day lives covering the things that matter to them in their own communities. Um, and that's because of the, the financial crisis that has been um, sweeping through journalism for the past 15 years. Uh, newsrooms, uh, local and regional newsrooms in the United States continue to shrink um, at a really drastic rate. That means um, newsrooms can't have the kind of breadth or depth of coverage that they, they had in the past. And that means things happen um, uh, that would have been exposed, perhaps, in a, in a time when there were more reporters on the beat. So I think one factor is um, there seems to be this uh, gap between the media centers of the United States in New York and Washington um, and the rest of the country. And I think that, that played out in the 2016 election. Um, and um, Yokai Benkler, um, in, a, in his book, does a really fascinating study about that, um, where the kind of, um, so there's a kind of disappearing local coverage. And the national coverage, in this case of politics, is focused on who's up and who's down in the polls, and uh, this sort of false equivalency, equivalency that I that I mentioned, and he catalogs the, the you know the the amount of stories that are negative um, about one candidate, and then you have to do a to be fair to be objective, you have to do a negative story about the other candidate, <laughs> but that's not uh, fairness. It's that's not false fair. equivalency. So I think there's at least two things happening. On the one hand. Um, people in their own local communities are seeing fewer and fewer journalists, so they have fewer and fewer interactions with journalists, less trust, and they see the, the national media perhaps focusing on issues um, that are not um, uh, responsive to what they see as the, the needs of, of their communities. And, you know, um, that uh, newsrooms should not, uh, I don't think audiences should dictate everything that a newsroom covers, but to effectively serve a community, a newsroom does have to listen and respond to what's happening in that community. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think, again, coming back to some of the examples mm -hmm. I mentioned, that's a way to, um, and that the platform Harkin is a way to automate that, that process, um, so to enable newsrooms to spot trends in their community based on the feedback that they're getting from their audiences and then to send out reporters to cover that. And what's interesting is that some news outlets actually bring audience members with them to do the reporting. Mm. Um, and that's another aspect of yeah. trust. Um, so how, does, how do journalists work? What do they do? Um, many people don't know and why would they know? Because they never worked in a newsroom. You know, I, I don't, right. I'm not more, a, I'm more, not a- More engagement with the public, yeah. right? That's what. And yeah. so I think, again, it's, it's, 
it's a little bit of like the human psychology and bias. If something seems unfamiliar and strange to you um, and is not responding to your needs, you're less inclined to trust it. But if it's familiar and close and you see that it's uh, not just listening but hearing what you're saying, then you have, you have more trust. So it, I think it's easy to define the problem in that sense, but to solve it <laughs> is really, really hard. Um, and these initiatives are, are trying to do that, but they're on a small scale, but that's actually not a bad place to start. But um, without the um, financial rejuvenation of, of local and reg regional journalism, um, I'm not sure how sustainable those, those kind of initiatives are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 그 전략적 침묵이라는 말씀하셨습니다. 그러니까 언론이 이 정치 양극화를 부추기지 않는 방법 중에 하나로 어떤 일이 벌어졌을 때한 발짝 떨어져서 조금 쉬었다가 아, 그 너무 그 아까 그 무슨 표현을 하셨죠? 그 옥시전이라는 표현을 하셨죠. 그 산소를 집어넣어서 불을 지르는 그런 일은 하지 않는 아, 그런 얘기를 하셨는데 사실 어, 오디언스 질문 중에도 그런 게 있었어요. 이게 사실 굉장히 힘듭니다. 그 침묵을 지킨다는 것이 기자들이 집, 직업상 뭐 무슨, 무슨 일이 있으면 일단 보도를 하는 것이 직업적인 것이어야 하는데 좀 어, 어, 우리가 현장에서 활용할 수 있는 좀 음, 활용 가능한 어, 대안 같은 게 있을까요? 이런 전략적 침묵을 언론이 좀 활용할 수 있는 그런 어, 사례가 있을까요? Um, yeah, in many ways it goes against a journalist instincts to remain silent. It's like I've been talking for 90 minutes up here. It's <laughs> obviously I'm not practicing strategic silence. Um, but I think what's important about strategic silence is that it's strategic. It's not just silent. And I think there are times, of course, journalists should report on the news and um, on what's happening in communities, and they should cover it with all the depth and diligence um, that they traditionally have. But I think for certain, um, for certain kinds of stories, maybe the, inf the, the, the information that's being provided journalists can ask themselves, is this really essential to the story? Like um, the not publishing the name of a mass shooter. Mm -hmm. um, we know through research studies that, uh, and, and through the own, their own testimony, people who commit these kind of crimes, part of the reason they do it is for the recognition. And um, it's also been shown by, in studies that Getting that, giving that person that recognition can in, instigate other people to do similar things. Mm. So is that publishing that name, is that serving journalism more than actually serving community by not publishing the name? And as I said in the talk, um, in a way journalists are being manipulated because of their own uh, instincts and their own journalistic ethics to report what happens accurately and factually, that's an ethical imperative of journalism. And people with bad intentions can manipulate that to amplify their own message. So I think that's a question that needs to be asked. And there are certain uh, circumstances where I think it can be a, a legitimate, journalistically sound decision not to report on something. And if um, if that information is not is essential for um, for some for some other reason, mm -hmm. and I think that um, is equally serving uh, a mm -hmm. journalistic imperative and journalistic ethics. I wrote down a few words from yesterday's conversation: is to report over immediate reaction and Im reason over impulse. Yes. That's what you said. Yeah, reason over <laughs> over impulse. <laughs> And sometimes journalists too, you know, um, need to examine our our, our own uh, motivations. And but I think and another also, and also the KKK story was very interesting as well. Yeah, there was um, there was a study done that in the 1920s and 30s um, newspapers in the South realized that when they covered um, the activities of the Ku Klux Klan, that um, um, 
uh, people, the, the number of people wanting to join that organization increased. Um, and of course, no one wants that. That, that should not be the uh, consequence of covering a, a horrible organization like that. Um, so journalists decided to remain street, strategically silent about certain events. They would still, of course, cover the KKK and report on um, the crimes that they committed, but for certain events, they would not. And that kind of took, took that step out of the recruitment process, took that step away from, from the KKK. And so I think that's similar to what's happening with, with mass shootings today. It's also becoming totally accepted um, for coverage of suicide. Um, where people's names won't be used, the method of suicide won't be mentioned. So this has already been, that's strategic silence too. So I think in, in some ways this has already been accepted more into the mainstream. I think there's still very, diff very strongly different views about strategic silence, especially when it comes to something a politician says. But again, the, the, the task of journalism is to tell the truth and report the facts, not to amplify Falsehoods. Transfer local community spaceship media Dialogue journalism practice and dialogue journalism 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 um, so as regards to spaceship media, I think what they're doing is is really interesting and, and very innovative, but they've just they've just begun. Um, I think the organization is just a couple of years old. And almost, it's, it's in many ways impossible to scale up what they do because they focus on um, small groups of people and they convene real conversations um, among those people. And they um, augment um, the conversation with journalism. So if people are discussing the environment uh, in their community and they have differing views about recycling, for example, the journalists um, working with Spaceship Media will go out and report on what is going on with recycling in our community and what percentage of waste is actually recycled. And so <laughs> the facts of the situation are injected into the conversation. And again, it makes it more difficult to have dueling fact perceptions. You can still be for or against recycling. You can be for or against using plastic straws but you can't argue with the facts, this is what's happening in our community. So that, in almost by definition, is a smaller um, initiative. But um, you can see the, the resonance that, that those kind of stories have, and StoryCorps has been around in the, in the US for, for many years, and it's, they have archives of hundreds, thousands of, 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 of stories from all across the country, and from people from all walks of life. And if you go into the archive and just start listening, it's, it's fascinating. And that's two people having a conversation. But again, the appetite for that kind of encounter um, is there because StoryCorps is, is really popular. And again, that's just two people, but the story of two people can have, um, can have a, uh, when properly amplified, can have, a, can have an enormous impact. So I think those initiatives are um, essential, but as far as what, what else can be done for to, to um, um, prevent and deter uh, political polarization, I have to come back to local and regional journalism. We need more journalism, not less. Um, and so I think an essential uh, 
an essential part of any um, solution is finding a financial model that can support um, local and regional journalism. Because I think publications like the New York Times and the Washington Post will probably succeed, but they're just part of the ecosystem. And as we all know, um, if I can use another metaphor, um, when one part of an ecosystem is in trouble or dies, it has an impact throughout the, throughout the, the system itself because it's all interconnected. And if that one layer of journalism fades... We should keep journalism alive to save our society, right? We should. <laughs> we must. 예, 지금 스토리 콜스 말씀하셨거든요. 여기 또 테드 강의 들어가셔서 한번 보세요. 너무 흥미롭습니다. 그리고 혹시 여기 젊은 분들 중에 스타트업 같은 거 하실 생각 있으면 한번 이런 거 시도해 보시면 좋을 것 같아요. 어, 그 내러티브 사람은 인간은 늘 인간의 이야기에 흥미를 갖기 때문에 그것을 누군가가 제너레이트 해주면 그것이 바로 저널리즘이다 이런 말씀을 하셨습니다. 어, 뭐 다른 질문도 많이 있지만 <웃음> 일단 오늘 많이 오신 분들이 너무 진지한 표정으로 저를 노려보고 계시기 때문에 <웃음> 제가 질문을 받겠습니다. Um, hi, um, my name is Renee Lee from Herald Business. Um, okay, I stood up. Um, <웃음> I am very, first of all, very happy to have your, uh, listen to your wonderful speech. Um, it gave me an opportunity to think of the gap between the ideal journalism and reality. Um, I cover political affairs these days and I face, I often face um, uh, experiences kind of making false equivalency myself. So. Um, I cover the uh, governing party and the opposition story. Like I try to cover it equally, but I know it's a false equivalency. But sometimes I feel like it's the uh, easiest way maybe for me to justify myself. I'm keeping fairness. But I, um, thinking back, I know I'm kind of, I feel like I'm contributing to political polarization. <laughs> So um, I just wanted to um, sh hear your personal experiences before when you were a journalist. Um, if you had any similar experiences and if have you ever, um, if you had ever um, came up with any solutions or how you overcome. And that's my first question and second, sorry. Um, well, you've, your issue is political polarization, and I think these days many media outlets um, use the political disposition as a mean to, as a mean to draw, attract more audiences, because the financial aspect cannot be ignored. I think so. Can you please comment on those news outlets um, using, maybe utilizing or? you know, the political disposition. Thank you. Uh, thank you for those uh, questions. Hmm. The, so the first question, I think um, covering, covering both sides of a story is not contributing, in my opinion, is not contributing to polarization if there are actually two sides to the story. Um, then I think you're, you're doing your job properly. And in, in any, um, if you're covering politics, there will always be um, at least more than one uh, side of the story. So if you cover the, the governing party and the opposition, um, that to me is not uh, on its face uh, polarization. But it, it really depends on um, what the issues you're, you're describing are. So. Um, for example, uh, something that might be analogous that's happening in, in the United States now is there are some 20 some, I can't even keep track anymore, how many um, candidates for the Democratic presidential nomination there are. And one issue that American journalists wrestle with is who do you cover? And how can you cover all those people equally? Well, you can't. And perhaps you shouldn't um, because some of those candidates um, don't have um, don't have a an, an argument or a policy or they're just they don't have the traction in the in the in the campaign that would justify coverage. 
So you have to kind of make coverage decisions based on um, where the, the news value lies. But of course you can make, <laughs> we can make and we have made um, wrong assessments of that because when President Trump uh, first announced his candidacy, no one took it seriously. So I think there's a real danger of writing off a candidate as having no chance. Um, but at the same time, um, coverage decisions need to be made and you can't have uh, a reporter covering absolutely every single candidate. So I think one way to um, assess w what should be covered is to think of what, what stories aren't being told, what, what voices aren't being heard. Um, Another good example, I, I just know American politics better than, better than South Korean politics, but um, coverage of like green candidates, if you think about the, the last election, they, they, hardly ever get, um, they hardly ever get the amount of coverage that candidates from mainstream parties uh, get. And if you r remember during the, yes, there was, and she got, I think, two or three percent of the vote. Um, which if Hillary Clinton had gotten two, th that two or three percent, she would be president now. Um, so that's a hugely influential candidate who didn't get anywhere near the amount of coverage that the mainstream candidates did. But another thing is uh, in the presidential debates in the last election, there was not a single question about climate change. So th th I think those are examples of um, like writing off an area of coverage because it's not relevant or that candidate doesn't have a chance. And that's a, that's a mistake. So one way to think about it and to justify your coverage decisions is to think about what voices aren't being heard, what issues aren't being raised. Um, and if you think about it now in retrospect, the no, not a single question about climate change during the debates, it seems insane. It seems absurd. Um, so if we had, kind of listened and examined ourselves, like what I know what, what's in the news, but <laughs> like a great advice to reporters is always, you know, go where um, other people aren't going and explore the things that other people aren't exploring and you'll find a, a story there. Um, you're gonna have to remind me of the second question. Second one was that. Oh yeah, so the, um, I just read, the other day that there's a, a website in the US that is, it will pay journalists uh, um, depending on the amount of, uh, they'll get a, like a bonus if their stories bring in um, a certain amount of, of traffic. And of course the temptation there in that case is to do stories that go viral, um, that get um, lots of page views that can then um, drive advertising revenue and, and, and things like that. And the, the danger, of course, is that the stories that go viral are not necessarily the stories that people really need to uh, engage with. And on that one, I wish I had <laughs> um, the answer to um, the, f the financial challenge. Um, but I think if, like, one, one thing that um, new, uh, American news out outlets are trying is to create verticals, like to create areas of content that are specialized um, for particular readers. So uh, if you are, a um, um, good example is uh, the organization Axios in, in, in the United States that just covers politics all the time. And so people who are political junkies will, will go there um, and um, they'll read the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal and the Post, but for like the really granular detailed coverage of uh, the capital, they will go to that website. So one strategy that's been effective for certain areas of content is to kind of really specialize in, um, in that area and become a, a must read for people who um, really want and need that information professionally. Um, I, I think another good example of that is The Economist, um, the um, UK publication. Uh, that they're one of the few general interest uh, publications that is, is still really thriving, but their focus is very much on business and um, they have the stories that they produce are um, regarded by their, their readership as absolutely essential to their, their jobs. And if you can become essential reading for, for an audience, and that audience can be, it doesn't have to be millions of people, 
It just has to be enough <laughs> to be um, economically viable to do the kind of stories that you want and, and need to do. And so that could be um, that could be politics, for example, in Axios, but there's also um, local websites starting up in, in cities like Seattle that just cover Seattle. And the people who live there in that community, they value that information. They're not getting that information from elsewhere, and they're willing to pay for it. So that would be a small newsroom of a half a dozen people, and they can, they can create enough uh, revenue to make that sustainable. I wish I had a... It's very difficult question, right? Hello, my name is Moon Young Kim, working at MBN, and I, it's a pleasure to meet you, and it was really impressive lecture, and um, I would like to um, um, uh, pose some questions in Korean <laughs> from now on. Uh, false or misleading statement, 그러니까 뭔가 잘못된, 요즘 망언이라고 할 경우에, 어, 그것을 보도할 것이냐 말 것이냐를 놓고 전략적 침묵을 말씀을 하셨는데 사실 언론이 너무 지금 매체가 다양하고 그러다 보니까 검색어 1위라든가 뭔가 사람들의 시선을 많이 받을 경우에 이제 데스크들 같은 경우에는 웬만하면 쓰자 그 왜냐하면 지금 다른 매체에서 썼으니까 인터넷 매체도 너무 많으니까 라고 하는데 전략적 침묵을 지키는 게 과연 가능할지 그럼 어떤 방식으로 좀 합의를 이끌어낼 수 있을지 하는 현실적인 한계를 많이 느꼈거든요. 그 부분을 질문 드리고 싶고 두 번째로 하나 더 질문을 드리자면 어, 그 인터그레이티브 디베이트 같은 경우에 통합적 토론 같은 경우에는 양극화된 주장이 나올 경우에 언론이 할수 있는 역할 중에 하나라고 하셨는데 이게 유튜브 같은 채널도 잘돼 있다 보니까 거기에서도 이제 전통 언론은 아니지만 양쪽에 다른 입장을 가진 분들이 가끔 얘기를 하기도 하고 그럼 전통 언론이 이제 그냥 그 매개체로서의 역할로만 한다면 뭘할수 있을까 하는 또 고민도 들기도 하는데 전통 언론이 좀더 그런 데서 좀 통합적으로 할수 있는 역할이 어떤 부분이 될수 있을지 말씀해 주시면 감사하겠습니다. Um, thank you for that question. Uh, I think it's um, the tension between strategic silence and covering stories that you know will be popular. I think that's a real, that is a real dilemma. <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't mean to suggest that it's an easy decision um, because covering certain types of um, statements can um, lead to stories going viral and that can have a, a, a benefit to the, the commercial bottom line for an organization and popularity. But I do think, I do think, I guess what I'm arguing is that a decision has to be made uh, about that. It's not, I don't think it can any longer be the case, well, person X, politician X said it, we report it. I think that's the way it used to be in the past. What I guess I'm suggesting is let's actually think about that and not instinctively report that and let's see what the consequences would be um, if we did report it, whether would that amplify misinformation or extremist views, even if it led to a, a, um, an uptick in, in our revenue and the popularity of our site. Um, so I guess what I'm arguing is I don't mean to suggest that there's not a trade-off if um, news organizations decide to do that. But I think a, that question should be asked. And a question should be asked, is that the kind of popularity that we are looking for? Um, is that the kind of journalism that we want to produce? And is that the type of um, uh, information that we want to share with our audiences? I think that's a legitimate question to ask. And if the answer is no, then I come back to my answer to the previous question. You can try verticals or a local website or um, uh, I don't think there's, uh, I think there was a time uh, when the solution to all of journalism's problems was v virality and advertising dollars and I don't think that's going to work. So. Um, it's, and I think it's incumbent upon news organizations to uh, innovate and experiment with their revenue models as well as with their um, 
with our journalism itself. And the role of um, uh, mainstream uh, news outlets um, and um, innovations in, in coverage in communities, I think, um, in integrated debate. Um, I think what the, the example I gave of the Washington Post is a really, uh, I think, uh, illustrative one in that um, uh, David Fahrenholt, he brought audience into his process of reporting. And um, so that's a little bit different from spaceship media, which is conducting in-person conversations with, with journalists uh, supplying information. But what he did was um, kind of crowdsourced his reporting. And so he was able to reach a much bigger audience. So that scales in a way that uh, a spaceship media conversation perhaps doesn't scale. And so he's also he's bringing people into the process and also showing them what the process is. And I think that goes to what we were discussing earlier about trust. And look, you, you, you can you can believe what you, um, you can have the, the opinion that you want to have about, uh, in this case, President Trump's charitable foundation, but these are the facts. You can't argue with it, and I showed you how I got those facts. <laughs> so every step of the process is transparent and it's documented, and I think that removes um, a large area where, in, in other circumstances, dueling fact perceptions could grow. Um, and then just one other development. Uh, there's also um, organizations in the United States like the Marshall Project, which is uh, an independent website that covers the uh, justice system and prisons, ProPublica, which is an investigative um, site that has opening um, regional offices ar around the United States. They're very young organizations, digital native, native organizations, but they've already established, established themselves as, as mainstream sources of, um, of news. And they've done that by having a very specific focus. Um, and that enables um, them to really um, explore in depth um, the, their area of focus in ways that uh, organizations that are covering everything uh, just can't at least not in a kind of sustained, continuous way. So I think that's another way that mainstream organizations can bring um, undercovered uh, areas into the, into the conversation and into, the, into civic d discourse in the public square. Young Chul Yun, I'm teaching journalism at the Yonsei University. As a person in the same business, I 100% agree with the, address, the issue addressed uh, this evening. And I'm deeply concerned uh, the fact that high polarized uh, situation is worsening uh, our journalism. Uh, but I would like to hear more about solution, which is hard part. Uh, you introduced uh, very interesting elements and important factors for good journalism, which, is, which are transparency, accountability, verification and I mean, dialogue journalism, crowdsourcing journalism, and so on. And, so on. and producing high quality news stories uh, does not necessarily mean people read that those high quality news stories, you, you know why. The, the business model is not uh, working that way. Uh, most social media, online media, uh, even partisan uh, legacy media benefit uh, from those kind of business models and they benefit uh, from the polarized view, extreme view, even uh, hateful speech. So my question is, as far as the business model is concerned, not journalism models, uh, what's the alternative model uh, we can uh, introduce to us other than subs subscription model? Because we all know subscription models is not working very well, uh, South Korean uh, situation. And my second question is, the polarization is a uh, very important factor, and uh, we are seeing polarization. But sometimes uh, we tend to overestimate difference between opposing groups. Uh, that kind of uh, uh, trend can lead to the kind of misconception toward others. Uh, one, one study shows that 80% of the extreme comments were hateful comments 
uh, of news comments are written by only 10% of the readers. So even on the part of the consumption, there is strategic silence, I think. So my question is, uh, I'm just wondering if there is any way, way is there any way um, for journalistic media can make uh, uh, those people engage in uh, lively uh, discussion, the moderate people? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, well, your first question was difficult enough, so I, I think it's rather unfair that you asked two really difficult questions. Um, as far as the business model is concerned, I think, um, I, think I mentioned a, f uh, a few uh, alternatives. What, it, it's kind of ironic that um, in the United States, at least um, many decades ago, very powerful individuals uh, owned newspapers and, and ran newspapers. And um, Agnes Neiman, the woman who donated the money to Harvard to found the Neiman Foundation, was married to a newspaper baron. Um, um, and then kind of uh, newspapers were not owned by a uh, single individual so much. And now that era seems to be coming back. Um, so I think the fact that the Washington Post has a, a very wealthy uh, owner and the LA Times has a very uh, wealthy owner in, in, in a way gives them an advantage that other organizations obviously don't have. Um, and that's why it's so crucial to develop these alternative sources. Um, now, I don't think, I, 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 I certainly don't know um, what, what the answer is. I know that, um, I know that organizations are trying various um, innovations to kind of um, create revenue streams. And I think the, what you said is correct. It's not, I don't think it's not necessarily that subscriptions don't work. I think subscriptions do work, um, but they're no longer enough. So um, when, I, when I worked for Time Magazine, uh, we cared a lot about subscriptions, but the vast majority of the magazine's income came from advertising, uh, not from subscriptions. And you know, you could get a subscription for, to Time Magazine for a very small amount of money because the advertising was so um, lucrative. And of course now both of those uh, sources of revenue are under extreme strain. Um, so I think subscriptions will be part of um, part of a, an ultimate uh, solution. But then there's other things like newsletters um, can be very, very lucrative. And, that, and again, that's another way to kind of create niche subjects um, that you can then monetize. Um, the, 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 the Times is, is, is doing that a lot and it could be anything from politics to like recipes or cooking. Um, in a way you have to, um, um, segment your audience and then try and develop news products that appeal to that audience, which you can monetize separately from the overall, um, the overall subscription. So I think that's uh, a lot of news outlets are experimenting with those things. And then there's um, um, a model like The Guardian in the UK, which is, um, I think it's, it's lost money for, for, for decades and has done, uh, great uh, journalistic journalistic work, but also always losing money. And they've come up with a membership scheme. Um, so they don't ask you to subscribe, but they ask you to become a member. And again, that comes back to the community point. They're inviting you to become a member of something that you value, a community of Guardian readers that you value. And that's a very different commercial approach than saying, Thirty nine ninety nine, and you're going to get twelve months of uh, the Guardian's news. It's like thirty nine ninety nine, and you can come to our events, and we'll send you this newsletter. So I think that emphasis on community is um, increasingly um, effective as a as a marketing strategy as well. And when you ask someone to join your community, it's a very different relationship uh, and a more personal one than when you just say you know, click here and subscribe. And in the United States, um, public radio stations and public television do that and have, have done that for, for many decades. And you become a member in 
my local NPR station, uh, WBUR or WGBH, you become a member. And donate. <laughs> and you give them money, yeah. And you give them money and um, because you want to have that relationship with what they provide. Um, and then I have to say, uh, one of the most robust news organizations in the world is the BBC. And that's funded by taxpayers. You have to pay a tax. <laughs> it seems kind of old fashioned, but in the, in the UK, you pay a tax on your television set. <laughs> and that money is used to fund, fund the BBC. Is journalism a public good? Like education or picking up your trash every Tuesday afternoon? Could journalism, uh, uh, um, could that BBC model um, work in, in other countries and other communities? I think it would have a very hard time working in the United States where people don't like being taxed for stuff. <laughs> um, but in Europe, uh, there's much more openness to that and um, there's complications around that in, in terms of the BBC competing with commercial broadcasters because they don't have the advantage of having that tax revenue. Um, but if journalism is a public good, then perhaps it's worth considering that we should fu fund it as such. Um, so those are the things I can think of at the moment to your very, very difficult question. And just remind me of the second difficult question. Enough. Oh, it's enough. enough. <laughs> journalism is public good, yeah. I'm not sure if you're going to say it. Journalism is public good, yeah. I'm not sure if you're going to say it. I'm not sure if you're going to say it. I'm not sure if you're going to say it. I'm not sure if you're going to say it. I'm not sure if you're going to say it. I'm not sure if you're going to say it. I'm not sure if you're going to say it. I'm not sure if you're going to say it. I'm not sure if you're going to 룰을 만들어 보겠습니다. 아무튼 어, 오늘 어, I think we're gonna end here. 음, 오늘 저기 너무 어, 좋은 어, 강연 잘 듣고 사실 정치 양극화라는 문제가 어, 정말 어려운 문제고 어, 좀 무거운 우리 사회의 주제인데 어, 어떻게 보면 해결책을 다들 찾으시려고 오셨지만 더 많은 고민과 문제를 가지고 또 미국의 사례를 많이 말씀하셨지만 우리 사회에 적용 가능한 것도 상당히 많이 있어서 저는 굉장히 도움이 많이 됐고 여러분들께도 그랬다고 생각을 합니다. 다들 그잘 돌아가셔서 우리 사회들을 달항아리를 유지시켜주는 그런 이음새 역할로서 어, 하시기를 제가 부탁을 드리면서 어, 마치겠습니다. 우리 저 제임스 기어리 부수장님께 다시 한번 큰 박수 부탁드리겠습니다. 네, 감사합니다. Would you like to say, say a word of farewell? Um, I just want to thank uh, the Samsung Press Foundation for inviting me here and thank you again for, for coming. I very much appreciate your interest and your very difficult questions. And for excellent questions. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so thank you, thank you all. Thank you.